Hour two overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Brian Hayes, Zero Dog, Jeff O'Neill, Jamie Noodles, McLennan. Got a big hour. Jerry's percentages later this hour. Darren Dreger coming up. The uh, Raptors tipping off on their new season tonight. You guys missed it. We had Darko Ryokovic on yesterday. Uber positive. Wants to play oh, yeah? everybody. Yes. Really positive guy. And I'm sure you two have played for a variety of coaches that, you know, apply a variety of different philosophies. Some are old school, hard ass, never complimentary. And he appears to be on the other end of the spectrum. I'm just curious how long that's going to last. It was, I've never played with somebody that was just uber, uh, like Paul Maurice, Peter Laviolette, they were like upbeat and it's like big game tonight, like be ready to go. But if you get skunk six, nothing gone out the window. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right, and that's yeah, what I like. Expect, miserable right? until the next like five minutes before the next game, where it's like, okay, guys, we got to be ready to go. But everything leading up until that is like, I hate you guys. Mm-hmm. What, like, this that's the biggest part about pro sports. It's like the mental strain. It's like you got to be able to handle the stress of not everything. When Jamie and I played, was all cozy. It's like, yeah, you're great. You're this no. It's like you lose. It's not a good feeling. No one's comfortable. And you were allowed to make players uncomfortable in a certain way. It was like, I don't think coaches, my coaches, wanted me going home and being like, yeah, I got to check out my suits for the walk-in next. They didn't want me feeling like they were like, this guy better come to play or maybe he doesn't play the next game. And that's where it's kind of different. Like guys are just like. They ain't doing nothing to me, so I'm on check out. I got to get my mm-hmm. good suit on and get the picks on the way into the rink. And I might go out there and absolutely have a 57 on my underpants, and nothing, no one, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> 57, <laughs> 57 on my seven? underpants. <laughs> that's just that's how you describe it back. That's your analytics. That was my analytics for the evening. Mm-hmm. My underpants were 57. 57. Expected, yeah. but I had a great pick. I had a great pick walking into the rink, and mm-hmm. I looked wow. good. Yeah. You, you know what? I I come back to the saying: is everyone's got a plan. You know, you got a plan at the start of the year, and the minute it goes sideways, the plan's out the window. It's it's that old saying: what is, you know, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the nose or whatever mm-hmm. in a fight. Like, yep. it, like that's really what happens. Everything's rosy when things are good. Everyone's gonna play. It's participation badges for everybody. And then the minute that things go sideways, that's when you see what you have there. And you start to point, you know, people start pointing fingers, all hell breaking loose. That's where you, you have to, you, you decide if you're a team or not. And the coach, he, he wants to win. He's going to start benching guys. He's going to start to, you know, try and press buttons to get guys going. That's, that's ultimately the reality of pro sports. Exactly. It's inevitable. Like at, at this point, I think it's a good approach you're a new coach, new team. It was pretty kind of dark by the end of last season. Nurse is out, Van Vliet's out, like two elder statesmen that kind of controlled the mood of the team. It was the head coach, really, and Fred Van Vliet. Like, those were the two guys, and neither of them are here. And, of course, Rayokovic is going to try to put his own stamp on it. And I, I get the impression he is naturally optimistic and positive. But they lose three in a row. I'm sorry, it just can't continue. And I don't believe that it will. But I think it's going to be somewhat of a shock to the system, even though he's rel- he's very new to the market. We don't have a great history of him. And uh, even when he was an assistant throughout the NBA, he was not a well-known you know, coach or assistant coach in the NBA. That's going to take some time to get used to is him snapping, right? Yeah. Is him losing it because it'll happen. It has to happen. I, c- I cannot accept living in a sports world where a coach does not lose it at least once a year. I know, some but capacity. you got to be careful about losing it because, as I said in the first segment we did today, sometimes players are like, "I don't like the way you talk to me, so I want to play. In, I want to play somewhere else." Right, and that is the nature of the beast in pro sports, in modern pro sports. Guaranteed money, big money. Players generally, they get the last word. You know, they more do. often than not, they get the last word. And um, that may be different with the Raptors here because Siakam's up in a year. OG Ananobi's up in a year. You know, Gary Trent's going to be looking for new deals in the future, Scotty Barnes. Um, but, again, I'm, I'm curious to see what Ryokovic brings to this team and his, his approach in terms of his disposition, how he speaks with the media, interacts with people, because uh, it's all rosy right now. Everything's great. 
and, and we'll see what happens once the ball gets tipped off tonight. Josh Lewenberg from Scotiabank Arena in just over an hour. Jerry's percentage is later this hour, but joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline, here's our TSN Hockey Insider, Darren Dreger. How'd you like the uh, frozen frenzy there, Dregs? Yeah, I didn't get to see as much of it as I would have wanted. I was in Winnipeg for the Blues and uh, the Winnipeg Jets, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the feedback seemed pretty positive, right? It, mm-hmm. it seems like something that the NHL wants to do more of, whether you can't really do it this year. The schedule's already built, but um, some of the radio work that I did earlier today, people were wondering on how they could create even a bigger event. I'm not sure how you can do that. I mean, you've got every team in the league playing, but maybe it's the buildup uh, around each game or pre and post and all of that. But I think generally it was well-received. Yeah. No, it's a cool idea. It's something new. I mean, I, I don't think anyone's going to turn down that idea. Why not try no, no. something? hockey yeah. all night long. It was yeah. perfect. Yeah. Just keep going. I mean, it was tough timing. It was up against Game 7 of the NLCS, you know, the NBA return last night. But so be it. You know, put your stake in the ground. Give it a shot. Try it. Uh, yeah. I thought it was a cool idea. Um, yeah, you were out in Winnipeg. You had to sit down with Mark Chipman, right? I, yeah. I've seen some clips. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we've talked about it. You've spoken publicly and reported on – What's going on out there? Ticket sales and stuff. I saw last night was the the least amount of tickets sold, I believe, yeah. in Jets 2.0 era. Um, obviously, COVID notwithstanding. What's right. uh, what did you pick up from that interview that maybe leads to you feeling positive, negative? Where are we at right now? Well, the positive is uh, you know the ownership group, which is David Thompson and Mark Chipman, True North. You know, isn't giving up anytime soon. But you know, you you remember back in the day. I mean, I was working in Winnipeg when the Jets became the the uh, Phoenix Coyotes at the time, and I know how hard the community worked to keep the Winnipeg Jets back in that day. So they're a long way away from that. But even though it's a distant memory, it's still a, a memory. But in a small building, in a small center like Winnipeg, man, it's a razor sharp line, isn't it? Financially. You know, the, the Winnipeg Jets pay the same player costs that every team in the league pays. They pay in U.S. dollars. So, you know, to go from almost 13,000 season ticket holders to now around 9,500, that's a pretty big dip. And I think what's been most alarming for everybody, certainly the organization guys, is the fact that they've had good games that even that haven't even come close to selling out. I mean, Pierre-Luc Dubois and the Kings come into town. Um, I think they had 11500 for that game. Likewise, for the defending Stanley Cup champion Vegas Golden Knights. And last night, you know, a pretty decent hockey game against the St. Louis Blues. And uh, as you've identified here, Brian, you know, it was a, a poor crowd. A little bit later start on a Tuesday night. I get it. But, you know, what I got from Mark Chipman, and by the way, that full interview will air uh, tomorrow on TSN and, and likewise in the Jets broadcast. You know, they're going to continue to search for ways to to get the corporate sector more involved to entice their existing season ticket holders, the walk-up groups. They're going to try everything to try and get more people back. They seem confident they're going to be able to, but it hasn't been good to this point. Dregs, so we talked a lot early in the show about teams with, you know, guys on long-term contracts with big money, and it almost seems like, if they don't want to play, they ain't playing, and everyone's kind of stuck with it and hating it. Like, is there a way the owners are going to attempt to fight back at this where it's like it just seems the players got a lot of power where it's like give me the yeah. money, and if you don't like it, chew on it. Yeah, I, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. You know, but not to take it back to Winnipeg, but that's that's why you better be sure in what you're investing in. You know, they, they know Mark Shifley. They know Connor Hellebuck because they've been in the organization for such a long, long time. They know how fiercely competitive they are. And you can say the same of, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs reinvesting in Austin Matthews and what's going to become of William Nylander. But when you're mm-hmm. signing those players, though, as unrestricted free agents, and better, you're better get it right. Go, you better get it right because you're 100% accurate. There's There's no guarantee other than, those contracts are guaranteed for the players. So the player is going to get paid. But, you know, hockey is one of those sports where I think for the most part, you know, the stars of the game are, are high-character guys who, you know, are stars because they compete hard. So 
Um, it's frustrating for owners. Every owner in the league has a contract or two that they don't love because they don't feel like they're getting full value in return, but they always find a way to reinvest and sign another big ticket. With Darren Drager, TSN Hockey Insider, um, you know, big tickets, investment, William Nylander, they're all synonymous at this point. Um, he was great again last night. He's been great early in the season. The yeah. Leafs, obviously, you know, they're, they're trying to get something done. Nylander said yeah. he's willing to continue to talk. Um, based on your history and your knowledge, not only of this situation, but just the league in general, the way GMs operate, agents operate, yeah, would his early season play like would that have any effect on on the numbers, on the term, on getting it done? Um, like, what what is what is your understanding yeah. of how something like this would play out, considering how great he's been early in the year? Well, it can because you know the general managers have bosses, and their bosses has a board or an ownership group, and normally you know those higher levels of of management are influenced by the market. And when you see a player like William Nylander play as well as he is playing right now, and it's, he's playing that way consistently dating back to last year. This isn't a flash because he, he appreciates that he's in a, a contract year. Um, it becomes problematic unless that player is willing to, to embrace what you've talked about to this point. I think the numbers have been pretty clear. I mean, Toronto feels comfortable at an eight-year maximum Probably in the nine seven five range, you know, in in that vicinity. Well, based on the way William Nylander is playing, he could make a sound case that he's worth more than that. He'd get a lot more than that on the open market. So, what do you do? Well, it's easy for him. Now it is, and it's a tough decision. But at least he can say, "Oh, well, I, I, you know, I gave them a chance. Um, I want to make big money because I've earned the right to see what that market is going to show me." And he leaves. That's his choice. And he can make that choice in the months ahead. But what if what if the pressure above Brad Trilliving is strong enough whereby they say, we can't let this guy walk. <laughs> like, he's too good a piece. So we had to figure out how do we keep him. And that's where it gets interesting to me, right? If you're keeping <clears throat> William Nylander and you're paying him north of $10 million, who's going? Is it Marner? Who is it? Somebody's got to go because four and a half isn't going to cover all of the big money guys. Dregs, uh, Joseph Wall gets a a start, to, you know, coming off that Tampa game, and you know a lot of has been made. Obviously, him playing well, uh, getting the start over Samson off. Uh, what do you make? Do you think that the Leafs can run with him a little bit and 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 see if he can be a a guy that can be a, a relied, maybe you know, budding yeah. number one goaltender? I, I think they can, Noodles, and, and they would have had that level of confidence going into the year. I think that the goalie split in terms of starts between Samsonov and Wall was a lot closer than people would expect. Yes, Ilya Samsonov had the edge coming into the regular season, even though he was he was porous in the preseason, and he just hasn't been able to, to find his form in the regular season. But, you know, history shows us that if you've got two good goaltenders, one who pushes the other – or you don't have a defined number one, that can be a healthy internal competition as long as both sides want to continue to fight for the net. So I would think that given the way Wall played, he's earned uh, more of a look just to see if, if he can run with it a little bit. But I think it's also so early in the year that they just can't, you know, kick Ilya Samson off to the curb. They're going to want to keep that internal competition alive and well. Darren, those Oilers, I think they're going to be fine and ultimately be right atop the West at some point near the end of the season. But, man, they like to make it challenging, don't they? Oh. Like they, they just, I don't know, it seems yeah. like once a year they have the coming to Jesus moments where it's like, what the hell is going on right now? Yeah, and that's where they're at right now, right? Um, and the pressure is is mounting. Without Connor McDavid, you know, the question was an obvious one. Well, who's going to step up? Well, it had to be by committee. Um, they they t- changed some defensive things apparently coming into this year. And so far, Dregs, what did they change worked. defensively? Like, the, like I don't understand. Yeah. What did the – like too many beers and the, the napkins got out and the pens? <laughs> like, I don't understand 
why yeah. it was like a complete philosophical change. What system right. did they come up with? They went with? to Box Plus One. Them and Tampa yeah. were the only. They did noodles. I'd never with- heard of that. I've <laughs> never heard of that. Well, <laughs> listen, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in quick. Hayes, have you? Yeah. You're a defenseman. It's, 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 it's a copycat. It's a big league. basketball form of defense. Right. Box plus one. Yeah, but if your coach and Barry said, Steph Hazy Curry. B, we're moving to the box plus one in our own zone, would you know what the hell that meant? I could give you a full breakdown, but let Noodles do it. Noodles just, all I'm saying is <laughs> it's a copycat league. Vegas won, and Vegas beat exactly. Edmonton a- at that. And right. so Edmonton believes instead of playing man-on-man where they were exposed defensively last year, that's where their details yep. got in trouble, Tampa went to it as well. So you can yep. see them actually thinking out there. It doesn't ex- make you. It doesn't give you an excuse to take three too many men penalties. It doesn't give no. you an excuse to 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 fall apart and 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 play like garbage. But you can tell they're thinking out there and they don't know what the hell they're doing. Like systematically, you can tell no. they're struggling. Put it that way. Yeah, yeah, and and that's exactly what they did. It was knee jerk to losing the Vegas Golden Knights. Right, it was they. They thought that they were as good or should have won that series. And defensively, they weren't, they, they weren't the equal of the Vegas Golden Knights. And in fairness, Vegas won the Stanley Cup. So they did everything to perfection. So I can appreciate embracing the copycat. But at what point early in the regular season, if you can't convince your troops to play that way, do you abandon it or find something else? Because Insane. you can't continue to give up seven goals a night. It's not going to fly. And and what will happen is, you know, it's, it's a Canadian market, right? I mean, the expectation is through the roof. How long before they start talking about the coaching staff? You know, that's, that's coming right around the corner. I'm not saying it should. I'm not saying Woodcroft is in jeopardy. But naturally, that's just kind of the way things go. Yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, we referenced yeah. it earlier. It's already happening Ace, in Ottawa. Uh, I wouldn't touch sure. the coach at Edmonton. How many coaches has McDavid already had? He had Hitch yeah. for crying out loud. Yeah. Years, he's had everybody. That's yeah. enough. No, and Woodcroft, um, you know, he's done, I think he's done a pretty good job, and it's six games. It's early into the season. Um, yeah. But, you know, Ottawa, we were doing our happy yeah. rankings a week ago, and DJ Smith was sitting at the top, and everything was all good. Now they've lost a couple of games in a row. They're back to three and three, and people in Ottawa are freaking out. Yeah, um, chant and fire DJ. Yeah, and it's, yeah. you know, listen, I, I think that's, I understand why fans are uneasy because of their history, right? They haven't been in the playoffs yeah. in a long time. They've they've invested in all these players. And yeah. I, I think a part of it, too, is there's uncertainty of what the new owner's going to do, right? Like, he's already inserted Steve Steos. That's his guy. Yeah. Steve's at the top. History would suggest in pro sports or in business in general, you get someone new in there, eventually they bring in their own people, so I yeah. think that's emboldening a lot of fans to be like, if you're going to do it anyway, you know, do it now if they're going to struggle. And I don't think that's fair to DJ Smith or Pierre no. Dorian personally at three and three. But that's my understanding of kind of the viewpoint of, of some of the Ottawa Senator fans right now. Yeah, probably is. And, and I can understand that too. But I always say the same thing. If you're firing DJ, who's better? Like, are you, are you promoting within? Um, are you hiring from outside? Like, uh, you know, those sort of changes can be knee jerk because, you know, even though Pierre Dorian has, has done a lot and the roster for the Ottawa Senators vastly improved, they started this season with, with holes in that lineup. Right. So it just seems to be, and, and let's hope it changes because Ottawa has the potential of being a very good story on the ice and, and off the ice. And, and I say that in belief of, of the direction of Michael Anlauer and Steve Stales. But, man, this team just can't seem to get out of its way. It's, it's all, it, it always seems to be one bad headline after another. So hopefully things settle down for them. Yeah. I mean, Noodles, we talked about it countless times, right? They needed a hot start because they had all those <laughs> yeah. home games. And I think that's kind of at the forefront yeah. of this. Well, like, you know, Buffalo got them last night. Buffalo is yeah. in a similar spot to them. And I think Ottawa fans are looking at Detroit saying, uh-oh, like what if they've yeah. actually figured it out before we have? You well, that's, know, and that's, that's the where concern. I went. That's where I went last night, guys. Their last two games, if you look at the Atlantic and also look at those two teams that they played, they're all in the same boat. They've retooled, rebuilt, whatever you want. And, you know, they're coming out the other side. 
and those are interdivisional games against teams that missed the playoffs that were just outside and going, yeah. hey, we want to take that next step. So you leave two points against Detroit the other day. Now it was Buffalo last night. Like these are these are critical yeah. points on home ice, but it's also against a very tough Atlantic like the Atlantic, Montreal's not an easy out. You know, we, we talked about it. Like no, no. you know, we, we all believe where we think Montreal's gonna end up, but yeah. it doesn't mean they're not gonna get points off of teams. And you know, they Jake Allen was brilliant the night before against Buffalo, took two points off of them. Like this is gonna be I think the Atlantic Division is the best division in hockey right now, just based on mm. one to eight. I agree with you. Well, and look right? at Boston again at six and zero, oh, and I, I understand they've played Anaheim and San Jose and Chicago, right. but still, it it was this would have been a very obvious stub your toe situation without sure. Bergeron, without Krejci, all those wins a year ago. Um, they've already banked. You know, they're banked 12 points. Yeah. They, they, they're, yeah. you know, all of a sudden you start doing the math. You're like, if they're 500 the rest of the way, they're in the running, maybe even make the playoffs. Yeah. It's an incredible yeah. start. It is. Terrific start. I mean, it's goaltending. They've got a good defense. Um, you know, Brad Marchand has been lights out good. And, you know, they've got young players like Patra and Frederick and Johnny Peacher, who, I mean, you don't replace the likes of David Krejci and Patrice Bergeron. But these young studs have come in there, and they've been difference makers. They certainly have. So, you know, Boston will come back down to the pack. I think Detroit will as well. But for the moment, they've uh, done nothing but develop just high-level confidence. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting start to the year, a very interesting start yeah. to the year. And we got the Heritage Classic coming up this yeah. weekend. And any word on McDavid, like any reason to believe he's <laughs> – they had his schedule. It was only a week or two, so it's not like he was yeah. supposed to be on long term. But no, but you know, if you ask him, he'd probably say, "No, I'll be good. I'll, I'll, I want to play. I want to play." But I, I don't think that's that's going to be reality. It'll be up to the medical people in Edmonton. I would think that the Heritage Classic at this point is a stretch for him. Yeah, well, man, they need him to play. Like they got to win yeah. games eight seven. He's got to put up five points a night the way they're playing right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, Dregs. We'll leave it there. Thank you for this. Hey, guys. Have a great night. Here's Darren Dreger, a TSN hockey insider, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Yeah, he'll be itching to get back, man. That's where it gets scary when you, you know, you're desperate and you feel like you got to get back in the lineup. Um, that is going to be something on the weekend. <laughs> that is going to be something because you're very familiar with that market, Noodles. They are not happy out there right now. They are uh, both, really both not markets. happy. Calgary Calgary's not, not far ahead of them. I think Calgary's slightly ahead of them just based on they technically have more points. They're one but game ahead of them. <laughs> it's happy not wise. great. Yeah, it's not great. It's really not good. Um, but Vancouver's winning games. You know, Vancouver's winning games. Winnipeg's now won a couple in a row. Um, the Canadian shuffle is going to happen all year. Like, it is going to happen yep. all year. The happiness meter will be moving and shaking all mm -hmm. year. That's the beauty of it. That's why we love it. Uh, Josh Lundberg in about an hour from Scotiabank Arena. Raptors, T-Wolves tonight, the home opener. We'll uh, tee that up with Josh. And Jerry's percentages is right around the corner. Jerry's got takes for days. He's got things to say. We'll catch mm -hmm. up with Jerry. We'll do that next. You're going to want to hear this. Jerry's percentages. I don't love being commissioner as much as I used to. I actually love it even more. That's the voice of a f Hall of Famer. Are you kidding? <laughs> have, you, have you been out drinking? Jerry! 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 You're all pigeons. Filthy, filthy pigeons. It's Jerry. G-E-R-R-Y. All right, Jerry's percentages. Here we go. Wednesday afternoon, around 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, our good friend Jerry checks in. He's got something to say right out of the gate here, so let's hear from Jerry, then we'll get to the takes. Jerry's frozen frenzy was the talk of the town this morning, oh. even though those nerds Adam Silver and Bobby Manns tried to upstage me with their loser spots. Everyone knows Jerry sits atop the sports commissioner's throne, and last night proved it. Yeah. Oh. Talk of the town. How would you rank the commissions? <laughs> in terms of popularity? In Just terms everything, what they do for their sport, 
Hmm. Like just happiness from ownership. Yeah. You know what's crazy? I might put Bobby Manns at number one right now. Rob really? Manfred. I'll tell you why. Dude, the pitch clock the... was a resounding success. Resounding oh, really? success. More so you than don't... any other rule that any other commissioners put forth. It wasn't that long ago Bobby Manns was practicing his golf swing outside yes. of a labor negotiation. <laughs> that <meeting>. hurt. <laughs> Admittedly, that wasn't a great look for Bob Manfred. But we just did the happy list a week ago. Things change quickly. You know, wow. Bob Manfred would have been number four at that point. Um, I don't. I, I think, don't think Goodell's number one. You know why? Yeah. Because they they just they just a juggernaut. They they're a juggernaut that yep. and they roll they steamroll everything. Mm -hmm. Controversy, no problem. Steamroll it. Like yep. remember COVID? Everyone shut down. The NFL's like, no, we're good. We're just gonna play. Yeah. Like they just they they. They are their own machine. Yes. They are they are a country. And yes, they, they, they are. They, they are. They're a, they're a giant. They're a juggernaut. He just signed yeah. an extension. Yeah, Goodell would be up there. Um, you know, Adam Silver, they're tr they're trying this um I don't know if you guys saw the promo for the in-season tournament. Like they're really trying to build that up as something no special. No way, dude. No, you can't get guys to care about yeah. it. But they're trying something. No. I don't know if it's going to work. I'm very skeptical. But it is something different. Um, in a league where you have a, a load management problem mm -hmm. and you're going to try an in-game tournament it or an in-season tournament, doesn't lunacy. seem likely to succeed. No. But, you know, the NBA, they're making a lot of money. A lot of money. Hugely popular. Franchise ta you know, <laughs> sales and, and valuations are through the roof. The belief is they're going to expand. Right, they're going to Vegas and probably back to Seattle. They're going to make billions of dollars on that. That's what's coming. So, you know, I think all the owners in all the four sports are probably pretty happy with things for the most part in terms of the amount of money they're making. I agree. Um, so, all right, you guys want to get to uh, the takes here from Jerry? Let's, Let's do go. it. Jerry's worst nightmare was the Heritage Classic going off without McDavid playing in it. But he'll still recover and win the Art Ross and Hart Trophy. Hmm. Still got him winning both, the Art Ross and the Hart Trophy. Wow. Ooh. Even with him injured, I think he should still be the heavy favorite for both. Yeah. I really do. But for the Art Ross, of... he still should be, for sure. No yeah. question. I am going to go... 75% instead of my usual 100. I just don't know enough about the injury. Is this guy going to be out more than two weeks? Like McDavid being McDavid, like a month is a month. It, I don't know. I'm going to go 75%, which is still saying that it's yeah. most likely to happen. Yep. I'm going 51%. Hmm. Where I would have been higher, but I, I'm playing the field because there's some guys that you can't win the heart every year. You you know you you can't have your best season every year. Uh -huh. um, can According I see to him some winning? you can noodles? According to some, you but, always get better, always what? improve. Well, you can. Well, he's it's Hayes taking a shot at you saying he's got 170 points this yeah. year. But <laughs> what I'm saying is he can win the heart Art Ross, and he could be in that heart conversation, especially. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not of the belief that he's going to miss a ton of time. No. But you know, I and and come back with some vengeance and 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 right the ship there. So that's why I'm at fifty one percent because I think the field there's. A, I I told you at the start of this year this this Jack Hughes is going to have a year and he's already doing him, it. I, he's got fourteen I'm, points in five games. I'm telling you, this kid is a player and yeah. and, and you know if he ends up having one hundred and twenty points this year and and Jersey. You know, looks really good in the regular season and stuff. Like He'll he, win the heart. He That's why I'm there. low on this. I'm yeah. low. Not the, the, the Art Ross is different. Now, we Jerry's packaged the two together. Like, to, this is how great McDavid is. He has eight points, and outside of that goal in Nashville, like, no one talked about any of it. You know, he, he's got eight points in five games. Um, so even though he hasn't, he, he hasn't played great by his standards, the Oilers have been a mess. Now he's been injured. He's still only six points back at Jack Hughes. Nothing. Yeah, like if he misses three or four more games and still plays 75 games, 77 games, I think he hits probably 130 points. That's probably the Art Ross. But if he's at 130 and Hughes is at 120, Hughes will win the heart. Like I think he will, which may sound ridiculous, but it's a narrative-driven award. 
He's never won it before. He's the first overall guy that Gretzky said is come. You know, that's the kind of stuff that'll happen. Right. So I, I'm going to say 40 percent. 40 percent. That's still incredibly high. It's a testament to the greatness of McDavid. The respect we have for the if guy. Hughes is going to if, if Hughes is going to do something like that, the one thing he has to have in common with Taylor Hall. He has to have like thirty points separating him between the second guy and his team. Yeah, which... remember how big of a thing that was? Where it's like Taylor Hall's got ninety something points. The next mm-hmm. guy's got forty. Yeah. Right. And everyone's like, "Oh my god!" And a, a part of that also was New Jersey wasn't that good, right? And he kind of dragged them into the playoff. That was again a part of the narrative. I think they finished right. eighth in the East. Um, where this Devils team is more than likely going to cruise past a hundred points and. Yeah, easily make team. the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Jesper Bratt has got nine points. It's early. It's it's very, it's very way too early to project, you know, where people are going to end up. Dougie Hamilton's had a very nice start. <laughs> Top 50 Guys. Dougie. <laughs> Top 50 <laughs> Doug. <laughs> Guys, I think you're misunderstanding something. I've always liked Dougie Hamilton. Yes. <laughs> it's a perfect no. drop. A perfectly timed drop. No, what was my con? What was my... What? You're going to say Do- Ovi? Doogie, Doogie Hamilton was always yeah. your guy. You're always a big fan. No, but my original argument was Ovi was not in the top 50. And Who Dougie do you Hamilton. think's been better early in the season? And be honest. Who hey, do you think's been better? I didn't see. I got blindsided, okay? Top 50 Dougie or your boy Alex Ovechkin, <laughs> who's just chasing Gretzky and couldn't care less about anything else. Right now, it's top 50 Dougie if you needed to hear it. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> right from the horse's mouth. Top 50 Dougie. Yeah. I love it. He might have been top 40, Dougie. Was he? I, I can't remember. He might have been in the top 40. Um, <laughs> all right, Jerry. What else do we have here? Joey Price, a.k.a. Jerry Price, a.k.a. Joseph Wallace, giving Jerry Rookie of the Year vibes. Because a nomination for the Calder is on the horizon. Uh-oh. Wow. Joey Price. Wow. Did Joe you, Price. Did you guys hear me call him Jerry Price yesterday? Did my you? Hit? No, I didn't hear that. So I did a hit for the panel. <laughs> You're kidding me. And I was, <laughs> Dothy, it was the tongue in cheek question. So he's like, you know, with Max Domi, you know, saying he's got the demeanor of Carey Price. And I said, well, let's just call him Jerry Price right now because he has, you know, has a been up for a Vesna yet, okay. all of that type of stuff. I so like I kind of made a smart ass comment, and I don't know if anybody picked that. Somebody tweeted at me, hashtag Jerry Price. I like it. And I so there was a few people that picked up on it, but I, I made a joke. I was I did the hit from Ottawa for the panel and I called him Jerry Price, just going, Hey, like let's let's cool the Jets on mm-hmm. Carey Price until he actually does something, but he, he was Last great. Last night he so looked like What was him. the question, though? Sorry, I, I, I interrupted. I called her nominee. Nomination. That's it. Top three. That doesn't mean he's winning it. But Joseph Wall nominated for the Calder. Where are we at? 15%. A lot of good rookies. A lot 15. of good rookies. 15%. Yeah. Yeah. 40%. Yeah. You know what? I'll go 43%. I well, think the goaltender, they – like this kid in Boston's pretty good. The, the kid that Dreg Patra, Dreg's knows the family. Yes. This kid is a great he's, start. He, that's a great start for him. And if he keeps chugging along, he's going to get some votes. The kid so, in Chicago obviously is going to get some votes. Yeah, but um, it doesn't look like I might have been, I might have got a little bit crazy with the 45 goals and the 100 points. Possibly. They're not a good team, man. That's the problem. I know they like, stink. Chicago's, they're they just stink. not a good enough team. Um, but I'm going to say 45 points, though, because the, the goaltender sometimes gets some love if he's dominant and he gets the team 100 plus points, blah, 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 and he's the main yeah. guy. He'll get some love. That's 43%. He, should. he starts 45 games and has a you know 915 save percentage or whatever, wins a bunch of games. You're in the chat, like you're in the conversation at that point. You yeah. know, Bedard's there. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with Fantilli, Logan Cooley. Uh, that Hughes kid, Luke Hughes, the youngest brother down in Jersey, is a guy that you know a lot of people have circled. But um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna say I'm gonna say 20, percent you know, which is higher, admittedly, than I would have said even a couple of weeks ago. But I think he's handled the moment well early. It's a first impression. It's two weeks into the season, but 
if the Leafs are a very good team, which I think they are and I think they will be, and he ends up starting, again, 45 games, that's a big sample size for a rookie on a good team. Like, he'll have good stats more than likely because of the team he plays behind. Right. So there, there's there's a chance. You know that's what? Right. He, he's taken a little bit of runway because he could have been thrown in Tampa Bay, cold, made excuses, and been terrible. And then the only time he was going to play again would have been a back-to-back if he went in there and he was junk there. Mm-hmm. So you get thrown in there. He said, you know what? I'm going to try to make something of this. And I'm just talking about as of right now. He, he's, he's made the most of it. And yeah, he deserves he to go in the net tomorrow night. Absolutely. Yep. He's done everything he could possibly do. The stats since he's been called up end of last season, the playoffs, same situation as the playoffs he had to go in. Played incredibly well. He looks like a composed kid. You know, he reminds me of a guy who used to play in Montreal. Yeah. He composed. Jerry Price. Jerry Price. All right, Jerry, let's see what else you have for us today. <laughs> Jerry Price. The Buffalo Bills are giving Jerry serious meltdown vibes. And they finished ten and seven at best this season. Uh, Meltdown vibes. Uh, Jerry might be onto something, man. The Bills are four and three, so Jerry's saying at best they go six and four in their last ten games. At best, uh, dude. Now, the look- Sports Center hits on the Bills are so hilarious. They go from immature, never going to learn how to win, to Super Bowl contenders after they blow a team out. Mm-hmm. Now, you'll never see anything like it, the ups and downs of their hits. It is a massive swing. But let me give you some context as to why I think Jerry is is sniffing out some meltdown vibes. Again, 6-4, and four, he's saying at best. That means four losses. That's all they can give up here. They are at Cincinnati. They're at Philadelphia, at Kansas City, at the Chargers, at Miami still. Some good teams. Those are some really oh, – oh. like at – Bengals at Philly Can at you Kansas say City. Say that again. Yes, that's what they still have on the docket coming up. Like they, they have at Cincinnati week nine, at Philadelphia week twelve, at Kansas City week fourteen, at the Chargers week sixteen, at the Dolphins week eighteen to end the season. Wow. That it feels like there's four losses in there. Like it really the way they're playing right now, kind of feels like there's four losses now. You know, then they got Dallas at home, the Jets at home, and the Jets have beat them before, and the Jets defensively can play. Okay, straighten out what the percentage is based on. It's ten and seven is the best they're going to do. Best they're going to. Jerry's saying the best they're going to do is six and four in their final ten games. The best is six and four. Kinda, I'm kind of eighty-five percent on I'm that. Kind of getting high too, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting worried, and I kind of think worried. it might be worse than that. Yes, I mean they. They got Tampa at home next week. They should win that game. I think they will. That's a Thursday night. It's tomorrow night. Um, they got Denver at home still to come. New England at home. They got to win that game. But you know, Dallas at home, Jets at home, at Philly, at Bengals, at Kansas City. Like that's tough. That is so tough. At Bengals, at Philly, at Kansas City. They they go back to back weeks now. A buy in between. Week 12 at Philly, then a bye week, then week 14 at Kansas City. That's the toughest back-to-back road game schedule you can find in the NFL. And yeah. they have it. So I, I'm going to say 70%. Like, I'm I'm definitely in the majority on this. 10-7 and seven probably still gets them in the playoffs. And if the Miami Dolphins are going to win the division anyway, it's probably all good. But the way they're playing, I'm 85%, they're oil here, and I man. think that could be actually worse. Yeah, they're leaking oil. <laughs> the Bills are leaking oil. Yeah, I'm I'm high on this. I'll say seventy two percent. I think it's you that schedule you named That's off, tough, that could man. be murderer's row there. That is. Like I I'd like to see the percentages in, in terms of, you know, what is considered the toughest schedule the rest of the way. I have to think the Bills are in the top top five, top seven for sure. Scotty Barnes is the clear cut best player on the Raptors by the end of the season. Okay, so that title would currently go to Pascal Siakam. I think the number two would probably be OG Ananobi right now. Are you basing this, Jerry's, on what the team would like to happen? No, or what just will in happen. Actuality. Actuality. We get to the end of the season. That doesn't mean collectively all year he was the best. We hit game 82, and you're like, this guy's the best player on the team. I'm like going to say he's 22%. Arrived. I think he's so big and so skilled that it could happen. But you have described 
the NBA as like a 27, 28 year old league. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's a slam dunk that it happens. So I'm going to go low 22%. Mm-hmm. Just from you going to bat on that premise yep. where it's like, it's, it's a kind of a veteran dude league, man. It is. It is. It's, it's a small court. They're big dudes. You got to be savvy. You know, it's a grind. You work on your skills. You get better as you get closer to 30. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm going to go actually a shade lower than you. I'll say 20% because, and it's more out of respect for Siakam. Like Siakam is a, he's a really good player. I think Barnes will be better than him. And I'm, I think the Raptors are banking on him having a better career for sure. But Scotty year three, I think he can get up close to it. And I think there can be portions of the season where you say that's the number one guy. Here's a side Jerry's for you. Siakam's contract comes up more than William Nylander's. Who, in terms of the general, Ooh. like the beat reporters around the team, just general contract talk. I'm going to say more. Willie, it's it's not even November, and Willie's contracts come up a lot. It, it has, and we're at fault because we just do yeah. it. I don't think it's been overbearing. Yeah, though. we haven't talked about it daily. No, um, you know, I literally brought it up to Dregs 40 minutes ago. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I did because I was complimenting how well Nylander was playing. Um, but I, I actually think it'll be Siakam. Because I think, I think with Nylander, the Leafs want him. I don't know what the Raptors think of Siakam long term. Like, that would be an interesting conversation. Yeah, if you could catch Masai and Bobby Webster in a closed door, what they really say about him. Right. I have an idea what I think they would say. I'm not going to share it. I'll keep that private. Oh, will you? <laughs> Why would you keep that private? <laughs> I don't know because it's not a nice. Th- it's just not nice. So okay. I'm not going to say it. So All right. no, your his name was in the rumor mill. All year, all yeah. summer. Like yeah. there's so there if a, they love the guy, do you think that that would would have been the case? Probably I'm, not. I don't. I don't think so. I think if they really love the guy, they would have probably worked out a contract by now. I think they and love I, the guy. I don't think they think he's a killer. That's what I think about. That's, yeah, that's what I think they think about him. I think that's true. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think they, you know, he's he'll be thirty, and they're like, okay, where are we going with now? Thirty again. He's still in his prime. He's still a really good player. But yeah, I, I think they would. They want a Lowry. They want a, a Kawhi. They they need an attitude at the top that drives success. And I'm not sure they are convinced that that's Siakam. And quite frankly, I'm not either. I don't think anyone really is. Patrick right. Beverly definitely isn't. What was the situation a couple of years ago with like there was like it was the five seconds left in a game, and he was wondering why he didn't get. He had it was that a was goof- a, he yeah. said that publicly to. Um, I want to say it was like a magazine or something. It he was did an just, interview. It was a goofy look, and it was a bad look. Like yeah. He was wondering about the ball and the last. Because he had been given the max deal, and it was like, well, you know, why is it going to Kyle or something like that? Or I can't remember who he referenced. But basically, it was like, I want to be the man now because you paid me to be the man. But I think you know what happened is that that was after a couple of games where he got the ball for the last sh- – and he screwed it well, up. he did. A couple of years ago, he had a really – Terrible season. Remember, he got benched. He, he got sat out a game. Nick Nurse sat him out. Yeah. yeah. Street clothes, literally. Speaking of which, you see street clothes last night? Zero <laughs> points in the second <laughs> half. Anthony zero. Davis had zero points. There's another. You talk about can't stop yourself. That guy just cannot stop himself. Oh. Dude, it, LeBron was pumping that guy up before the season saying, this is the new guy. He is the guy now. Right. And he asked zero him, points. Zero points in the second half. There were so many, there was so much great online content last night because he was talking. AD was talking a big game about how motivated the Lakers are to shut up Denver, and they're going to show. He's like, yeah, he was motivated for one half to shut them up. <laughs> one half of motivation for Anthony Davis, and then that was the end of the road. Um, all right, there you go. We'll save some uh, Jerry's for after dark. A little Jerry's after dark coming up. Speaking of the Raptors, Josh Lewenberg will join us live from Scotiabank Arena. That's coming up in about 20 minutes. The World Series is set. We'll look ahead to that. Only one game in the NHL tonight. The Leafs are back in action tomorrow night down in Dallas. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 4. All right, TSN 1050's Leafs lineup is your chance to win Leaf tickets every week all season long. As every weekday, we will announce a current or former Maple Leaf player. And on Fridays, you'll have a chance to call in and name the Maple Leaf lineup. We're giving away tickets to see Leafs Sabres November 4th, Saturday night game. And, uh, again, if you name all the players in the lineup, you will score a pair of tickets to an upcoming game. Uh, today's player is Paul Henderson. The oh, great wow. Paul Henderson is today's 
Leaf Player of the Day. This week we're giving away a pair of tickets again to see the Leafs take on the Sabres November 4th. That Brady Kachuk, Alex Tuck fight. Um, like Tuck, I don't know what Tuck was doing, sticking his leg out like that. Like what was he thinking Kachuk was going to do? Just let that pass? I mean – yeah, no, you think you're gonna get away with that one? I, I, you were there, Noodles. Like, what was the what was going on there? Because so if if you go the play before it, Kachuk got his hands up into Tuck's kind of head like a forearm shiver. Mm-hmm. So that that was literally the play before it. So then, as Brady circled back, that's when Tuck kind of you know blindsided him. They locked knees or whatever, but like yeah. Tuck gave him the the hip check, and that's what it caught Kachuk off guard, knocked him down. That's where he got up and. You know, gloves were off right away, right? And that was a serious fight because that talks a big man too. Oh and yeah, they're they're dude, monsters. When Brady when Brady had grabbed his shoulder, I was like, there goes their season. I, oh, because they were having such a bad game too. Like it was oh, everything. Was... You know, every mistake they made ended up in the back of their net. So it's five one. You know, it, it seemed like an innocent, innocent hit. He kind of pushed into him and, and right away dropped the glove and was in. Mm-hmm. And, and usually, you know, a guy like that who's big and tough, go sit on the bench and kind of shake it off. He went right down the tunnel. Right. And I was like, oh, he was my nervous. God. Like, the he whole was building, the building was silent. And I kept thinking to myself, like, they're going to come out and announce, you know, upper body injury, not going to return tonight. And then we're talking today about him out for weeks or something right. like that. All of a sudden, he comes skating out in the third, and he's got a purr on like yes. he's he was an animal, which yeah. was you know good he was for him. Not but, happy. No, he's yeah. tough as tough as nails, man. And that yeah. Um, and Tuck is a big tough dude too. I mean, to yeah. his credit, he's like, all right, let's have a go. Now he took a couple, man, and he, like he his yeah. face after the game, it had already swollen up. But yeah. um, you know, Sabers with a win last night. Um, all right, Josh Lewenberg coming up from Scotiabank Arena. Jerry's after dark still to come as well. Final hour up next. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2.